what I would like to do over these um, over this conference weekend is to look at the book of Ruth. And uh, if the Lord allows, we'll go through each chapter and the sessions that we have available. And we'll trust we'll touch on some of the things that have already been said, uh, but some of the things that I think are most needful for us in our present circumstances. We've already been thinking of the difficult times in which we're living and no greater book than Ruth than to encourage us, to encourage us in such difficult circumstances. Now, we're going to read the first chapter, but as I mentioned, this with the book of Ruth, there are some people here who know a tremendous amount about it and know that you could exhaust four years looking at the book of Ruth. Some have probably never even read the book of Ruth. I'm not sure where you stand here, but what we're going to look at is some what we call typical teaching. We're going to look at this book and draw out from it some practical lessons for us. We're going to see some dispensational things. We're going to see some uh, basic historical facts that have occurred and where it sits in the Bible. But what we want to glean from it are some practical lessons for us today. So let's just start with chapter 1 in the book of Ruth, reading from verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled or the judges judged, that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Marlon and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. And I just want you to notice that word left. We're going to see that right the way through. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Marlon and Kilian died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with the daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people and giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return, each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will. We will return to, unto, uh, with thee unto the people, thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, I should have a husband also tonight and should also be a son. Would you tarry for them till they were grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it is me much for your sakes. The hand of the Lord is against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And all but kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she, that is, Naomi, saw that Ruth was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So they two went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass, when they were come to Bethlehem, that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call you me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabites, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of of barley harvest. Now we are confident that the Lord will bless 
a public reading of his word, but we do look to him just to bless our hearts as we look into this word. The book of Ruth is the most beautiful book. It is a tremendous book, and uh, it is a story comprising only four chapters, but a story which provides many beautiful pictures of God's redeeming grace. We'll see some beautiful pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ and the man Boaz. We'll see some pictures of, of us, where we were, what, what we once were. as poor, lost, Gentile sinners brought in by the gracious hand of God. We're going to see some encouragement out of that. I trust you've not lost the joy of your salvation. Some of us get cold. Some of us look back. And some of us memorise and wonder and dream about the good old days. But God has still not stopped blessing and is able to bless and do exceedingly above all that we ask or think today. And so I want to encourage us as we move forward to look forward to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The author is unknown, but many agreed at Samuel. But when, uh, look at what we start with here, and it came to pass that when the judges judged. And so if you look at the previous book, it's the book of the judges. And if you look at the book that follows it, the first four of the books of the kings or the first book of Samuel. And this just stepping back from it, if we just might say a few things, I don't want to go over too much introductory ground, otherwise we're going to have a great problem here, but there's just a few things that I want to point out before we move into it. The book of Judges records the lowest ebb in the history of the nation of Israel. Great departure, great disobedience, rebellion, moral depravity, indolence, sexual immorality. It abounded on every side. It was a very, very sore and sad and pitiful state that the nation of Israel were in, in the book of Judges. We're not exactly sure when the book of Ruth or the, the narrative, the historical events in the book of Ruth occurred. Some tend to think that it was at the time of Gideon when the Midianites impoverished them. I tend to think it's a little bit earlier, around the time when Ehud, that that big fat man, but Eglon, that big fat man, a picture of the flesh, was in rule and reigning over and he had suppressed the people and they were impoverished in a sense in that way. Wherever you put it, I'm not going to get into an argument with you. You've probably got a better idea, but be that as it may, here is great anarchy and democracy. What's the last verse in the book of Judges? Every man was doing that which is right in his own eyes. And beloved, can I say with gentleness and with care and with love, I think many of the Lord's people are living their way, that way. We've just heard about God's assembly and God who is supreme, the God of our salvation. But many people are doing that which is right in their own eyes. But then when you come to the end of the book of Ruth and into Samuel, what do we see? We see a monarchy. We see rule. God restoring things. False worship being dealt with. And what you can see there is a beautiful picture of how we can get from anarchy to monarchy, the rule of God. And this, of course, is a beautiful picture of recovery. And what we've just read in chapter 1, if we were to read the whole book, it would only take you 10 or 12 minutes, 85 verses. Five verses record a horrible state of departure and misery, the calamity. 80 verses of an unfolding story of us. And this is just the way God works. We don't want to focus on the negatives, but in light of the negatives, we can see the goodness of God that leads us to repent. May God just help us to see in these days in which we're living that God can still redeem and recover and restore. And whatever state you're in, whether you are a new believer, freshly saved, no knowledge of the Bible or of God, or whether you've been on the road for 50, 60 years in your salvation years, whatever state you're in, whether you're a husband or a wife, a man or a woman, a young child or a grown adult, whether you're a backslidden Christian, 
going out into the world, looking for food, or whether you are going on serving and pleasing God in every detail of your life, whatever your circumstance is, you'll find something to glean from this beautiful book. It is a most beautiful book, and I trust that we'll all get something out of it, something for our encouragement. Just by way of division, what we want to look at is three separate divisions in this first chapter. A sojourning from Bethlehem, verses 1 to 5. They're sojourning from Bethlehem, going away from the house of bread. Verses 6 to 19, they're returning to Bethlehem. And then 19... 19b, if you want to use that, there's a stirring in Bethlehem. So there's a sojourning, a returning, and a stirring. And if we look at this first little section here, the sojourning from Bethlehem, I want you to note with me the circumstances. When the judge is judged, we've already just mentioned some of the, the horrific circumstances that, that, that they were in. Well, think of the chastening. There was a famine in the land. We're going to be thinking of the correct place, Bethlehem, Judah, the house of God. We're going to be thinking of the carnal place, Moab. There's the right place and the wrong place. God has called us to be in the right place, but so often we dabble and we just want to get our toes wet. God has called you out from the world. He's put you in a place, the house of God, Bethlehem is the house of bread. The assembly, a beautiful picture of what the house of bread ought to be for the people of God, full of sustenance, nourishment, encouragement, fellowship, food from the hand of God, provision, protection. That's the correct place, the carnal place, Moab. Oh, it looks so good, doesn't it? Just away on over there, not too far. Looks good. It's got everything that will dazzle the eyes and the heart. Build to you. It's the carnal place. We'll look at Naomi's calamity. Elimelech. Naomi's husband died. We'll look at the family collapse. They took wives of the women of Moab. What that might mean for us today. We'll look at Naomi's catastrophe. The woman was left with her two sons and a husband. When they return to Bethlehem, we'll see the contrite turn of Naomi. She arose and went forth, verses 6 to 7. Whatever state you're in, if you are still alive and breathing air, there is an opportunity for you to be recovered. I want to encourage anyone here, backslidden, downcast, discouraged, angry, things aren't what they ought to be, Opportunity for recovery. We'll see Naomi's first argument for Orpah and Ruth. Go, return, verses 8 to 9. First of all, we'll see a, a united response. We will, we will. People everywhere saying, yes, I believe. But then comes the second challenge, the second argument from Orpah. Turn again. And not now do we see a united response, but we see a divided response. We see one cleaving and one leaving. It's always good to be challenged. Examine yourselves and see whether you are in the faith. Then when we come to the stirring, what we want to look at there is the movement that they caused. The whole city was moved when they saw people coming back. Trust you have a heart for the people of God. The Mara that she claimed. I want to think of what that means. The mistake that she confessed. I went out full, but the Lord brought me home empty. Verse 21. The Moabite that she came with. And the mouth, uh, sorry, the month that they came. They came in the beginning of barley harvest. We're going to see some beautiful things, but just stepping back from this. Again, chapter 1, we'll see 10 years, roughly, 10 years, depravity, silence, nothing. Chapter 2, we'll see something like 49, 50 days, beginning of the barley harvest to the end of the harvest. Chapter 3, we'll see a night. Chapter 4, we'll see several generations going on. 
I just want you to just take a, a look as we look at this book, just to step back and look at it in its pictorial sense of all that God is communicating to us. But may we hear what God is saying to me. God wants to restore. God wants to recover. God can redeem and God can bring back those who are impoverished. And so what we're looking at here, firstly, is the circumstances in which they were living. I can't quite see that clock, is that? What time is that? Oh, that's very good, thank you. The times in which they lived. A period of great apostasy. Think of where judges began. Joshua. Joshua brings them into the land. Tremendous victory, tremendous conquest, and a tremendous a conquest. Battles were won. There was conflict, there was conquest, and they were brought into the land victoriously. But then you read very sadly, Judges chapter 2 and verse 10. There arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. That's chapter 2. A new generation. They would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a-whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them and turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in. What's wrong? Very easy to do that. Judges chapter 5 and verse 6 to 8. The highways were unoccupied and the travellers walked through the byways. We don't need this stuff. We'll go our own way. The inhabitants of the villages ceased. Fellowship. We don't need that stuff. I don't need to go anywhere. I'll do my own thing. Besides, I'm saved. I'm a Christian. They chose new gods and there was war in the gates. Think of what the gates mean in this book. Gates are always um, an illustration of the administration, the government of God. And there is war in the government of God, war in the gates, and there is no shield nor spear seen among 40,000 in Israel. That was the old one. We don't need those old things. We've got new methods. We've got new techniques. God's tried and trusted methods of dealing with the enemy have not changed. They got rid of the spear. They got rid of the shield. We don't need that stuff. And what did it lead to? Well, We've already mentioned there was no king in Israel and every man did that which is right in his own eyes. There was anarchy. Why? There was democracy. What does democracy mean? Well, democracy comes from two Greek words. It's, very it's just the people. And the second word that forms democracy is kratos, dominion, power. And what does democracy mean? Rule from underneath. Rule from underneath. That is what we live in, a democratic society. The world that we live in, we vote. The people vote. The people put government in power. We have a say with where the government goes. We know that God is supreme and overall, and he is the one who puts people in power. But stepping back from that, we see that the people here in this country choose what we ought to do. And that thinking invades the people of God. We have a right. We should choose what we should do. We don't need government. We don't need to submit to authority. We choose. And so democracy, ruling from underneath, they're the circumstances that they were in, and they're the circumstances you and I are in. In one sense, we are characterised and shaped and formed by our circumstances. In one sense. But I think a far greater Truth is this, you and I characterise our circumstances. When people will look back to 2020, what will they say? These people did this. These people did that. We can't say, oh, our circumstances, it's so hard. It's so awful. Things aren't what they used to be. We shouldn't pray anymore. It's just too hard. Is that the negative attitude that we have? And here is a people who said, I'm going to get up and get out. Elimelech, he went to sojourn 
too tough. There's a famine in the land. Beloved, I believe with all my heart we are going through a famine, a deep spiritual famine. What is a famine? Well, you know as well as I do. Rain from the sky comes from God. It waters the earth from which we get harvest and we get food. And when there is no food, we question. God is holding back. The winds of heaven are shut up. There's a famine in the land. What is that famine, you might ask? Well, if we were to turn to the book of Amos, chapter 8, and verse 11, behold, the days have come, said the Lord. I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. You see, the famine was of the heart of the people of God. This was a land flowing with milk and honey. This was a land that was full and fragrant. It had fresh fruits. It had everything for them, for their supply. Yes, it had the Dead Sea. And it had a river going through it, the River Jordan. But all of their provision was dependent upon the winds of heaven and God blessing them. And isn't it strange that just 50 miles away, there's no famine. I believe God is speaking to us in our hearts today. There's a famine. People are not reading the word of God as they ought to. People are not getting down and studying the word of God as they ought to. People are not talking about the things of the Lord as they ought to. We have every form of material entertainment, of possessions, material wealth, prosperity. We have it all. But I want you to examine your heart as I examine mine. Is there barrenness? Is there dullness? Are we cold? We look warm. Where do we stand before the eternal God? Are we going on fresh, recognizing the circumstances in which we live? Or are we just like the world, satisfied in it? And here is a man, Elimelech. I believe a man of great wealth. He's of the family of Boaz, he's in Bethlehem. In his God-given inheritance, a long lineage from the tribe of Judah, Bethlehem Judah. There were two Bethlehems in, in, the, in Israel. He's in Bethlehem Judah. But this man is not thinking about going on. This man is thinking about getting up and getting in. I want to ask some of you young people, are you thinking about that too? What about some of you older people? A father. A grandfather, a mother, wherever you are, whatever you are. When you face difficult circumstances, do you look into the face of God and ask why? Is it me? Or are you thinking up and out? That's what he did. And he thought about just himself. I'll go down to Moab. And that's where he spent it. Ten long years until his death. You see, it all looks so good on the other side. I'll just go for a little sojourn. I'll just go for a little sojourn. That's what it starts with in verse 1. He went to sojourn. But look at verse 2. They continued there. And then look at the end of verse 4. Ten years. Don't ever think that you can just get out. Look, I'll just do it for a little bit. You know, I'll be right. It'll be okay. I know what I'm doing. I'm strong. I know my Lord. I pray every day. A compromise between God's will and human logic never works. Look at what happened to him. He dies. And there he died and left his wife a widow. And uh, we'd love to look at the book of Lamentations, but there's a beautiful picture of the nation of Israel in Naomi, a widow, bereft of her loved husband. 
sorrow, sad, out of the land where she ought to be. You just read chapter 1 of Lamentations. Most of us turn to that because, behold, is there any sorrow like unto my sorrow? Wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his great anger. Pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ, of course. But that contextually, speaking of the nation of Israel, Naomi, she's a widow. But then while they're down there, dad dies. Well, it's time to get some husband's boys. Well, you know, dad didn't think it was such a problem to get out from the house of God. Well, why don't we just marry Moabites? Sounds pretty reasonable, doesn't it? Good looking, fair country, plenty of food. God has made it clear. Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. Do not think for one moment that God's way of doing things is not good for you. God gives us these things, and I'm going to quote a dear brother who's here right now. God gives us these instructions not to make us miserable, but to deliver us from misery. And here they are. Dad's died. Well, we'll just marry. We'll marry Moabites. And what happens to them? They die. There's Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah, widows. They're in the carnal place. They came to the country of Moab, and we'd love to look at this in great detail, but Moab speaks of the flesh. It's an, it has an origin with incest. Lot and his two daughters, his two daughters got him drunk. And they, they lay down with him. And one of them is called Moab. The child that is born to the first daughter is called Moab. The child that is born to the second is Ammon, the Ammonites. And those two rival enemies plagued the nation of Israel for years. It speaks of indolence, idleness, inertness, indifference, the flesh, everything that is opposed to God. The king of Moab, we've already mentioned him, Eglon. He was a big, fat man. The fat speaks of the flesh. But he lay solitary in his own power. It's good just to satisfy the flesh sometimes, isn't it? It does feel good, but that's not what we are exhorted to do. We are to cut off the flesh. We are to put it aside. But they decided, we'll go down there for a little while. Won't be long. We'll just entertain ourselves. There's a famine here, not much food. Instead of investing in the people of God, seeking to restore the house of God the former days, up and out. I want to challenge you, every one of you, what are you investing in the house of God? Or are you thinking of a great exodus? The first, we're going to have to skip over a number of things. I'll leave with you the study of the great enemies in the book of the Judges, Mesopotamians, the world, Moabites, the flesh, the Canaanites, the devil, the Midianites, strife in the house of God, the Philistines, squatters in the land, five principal enemies in the book of Judges. And here is, that's why I'm sort of thinking maybe it's in the early part of uh, Judges in about chapter 3. So they did what was right in their own eyes. And he leaves the house of God. He leaves Bethlehem. This is a third occasion. The first two are in Judges. Judges chapter 17, there is ecclesiastical failure. A Levite leaves Bethlehem and goes and associates himself with idolatry. This is just what we see in all the ecclesiastical systems of the world. Paid pastors, paid ministers, getting royalties, getting pomp and position and power and preeminence over all of the people. The clergy over the laity. Ecclesiastical failure. You see, he wanted a position. Then when you come to Judges chapter 19, another man from Bethlehem gets up and gets out of the house of bread. There we see moral failure. Gross immorality. Doctrinal sin, moral sin. They're the two sins that plague the people of God. And then Ruth chapter 1, domestic failure. You see, there was no bread in the land. There was a famine in the land, but God has spoken. The famine was in the heart. It was in the house. What you are in the home is what you will be in the assembly. What you are in the home will be what you are in society. 
in the workforce, in your school, in your universities. You can't just put on a garment and carry a thick Bible and think everything is okay and say the words, memorize the verses, whatever it might be. What you are in the home characterizes everything about you. And so there's famine in the home. Up and out. First failure, they leave. And then what we see is a, a, a grave disappointment in the death. We've already mentioned that, but the marriage, the two sons get married. And it made, God made it very clear, you will not marry the other generations around you, the nations that are around you. Deuteronomy chapter 7. In case you're wondering why it isn't okay to marry an unbeliever, let me make this very clear. I married an unbeliever, but I was an unbeliever. I was unsaved, and so was my wife. We knew nothing of the counsels of God. Marriage is creatorial. We didn't have to get married all over again. We are married, and we were married. But if you are a believer, God expects you to not marry an unbeliever. It's pictured for us in type. It's given to us. Uh, in, in doctrinal form in the New Testament, and all the illustrations concerning failure as a result of disobeying God's commandment are brought before us here. Deuteronomy chapter 7, do not marry. The Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter shall not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. Why? Listen. They will turn away thy son from following me that they may serve other gods. You marry an unbeliever, guess where they're going to take you? To their unbelieving gods. Their pastimes, their practices, their pursuits, their passions, their appetites, everything about them. Who do they worship? Their bellies, their minds, themselves. That's where the unbeliever will take you. And it's called an unequal yoke. I don't need to tell the pharmacy what a yoke is. You put a yoke on two cattle to bring them together. So they work together. But if one cattle wants to go that way and the other cattle goes that way, wants to go the other way, it's an unequal yoke. It doesn't make sense. There's going to be tension. This way, this way, this way, this way. You've only got to look at a home where there's a husband who's saved or a wife who's saved and a husband who's not. It's miserable. It's miserable. Ezra chapter 9, Nehemiah 13, we've not got time to look at it. But the New Testament truth, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. And if that's what God says, that's what God says. Leave it there. <laughs> Naomi's catastrophe. The woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Absolute tragedy, failure and ruin. And here's a silent witness of what it means to turn away from God. Maybe God is chastening us at the present time. Hebrews chapter 12. Don't look at chastening with objection and rejection. Look at it in the face of God. What are you dealing with me for? Why are you speaking with me in this particular way? Chastening never for the present time is joyous. You don't wish it upon anyone. It's good when God chases us because that's at the time that God can speak to us. But afterwards, says Hebrews chapter 12, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And if you are a child of God, I want you to expect chastening. For whom God loves, whom the Lord loves, the Lord chases. So be sure of this. If you're saved, you'll get chastening. If you don't know difficult times in your life just yet, stick around. You will. And God can speak. May God help us to look at chastening with a, a reverent and a, a receptive heart. And so they come to this point where she wants to return. She is contrite. She's recognised her failure. And just before you uh, wonder what I'm thinking with Naomi, I don't take for one moment the criticism that is levelled at Naomi. Here is a spiritual woman. You look at all that she has to say. There are eight conversations that she has with uh, Ruth. And there are many, many instructive lessons for older women to teach the younger women to press on. Here is a spiritual woman. She taught Ruth and Orpah. How do we get to what 
Ruth confessed had she not been taught. I don't take for one moment all the criticism that's leveled at her. Here is a woman of God. She's in Moab, but she's no, no Moabitess. Her heart is with God and she wants to return and to go back. Now, again, I'm sorry, I can't see the, the plot for the reflection. Ten to quarter past. No, the hour. Sorry, my mistake. <laughs> yeah. So the contrite turn of Naomi. She had heard. Let's look at this. This is beautiful. She had heard in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited his people and giving them bread. I wonder who it was that brought the good news. No name? An unknown messenger? The Lord had visited his people and giving them bread. I just want to speak to those with a gospel heart, an evangelistic heart. Here's an unnamed man, an unknown man, but he's gone out and he's given a message. The Lord has come. The bread from heaven has come. And it has generated a response. It has restored or be the beginnings of Naomi's return. And it's just won the heart of Ruth. Do you think he knew of the posterity that would emanate? When we come to the genealogy in chapter 4, do you think he knew anything of that? Be encouraged. You may know nothing of the revival and the recovery that come from you, that can come from you just continuing and quietly with, with all, uh, without all, all of the accolade and without anybody knowing about it. Just continue to serve very preciously. I love this uh, unnamed servant. But here it is, good news of God's goodness, and it caused her to want to come back. Now, the first argument uh, given to Naomi and Ruth, she's looking back. She looks backward and says, look, you know, you have been so wonderful and so kind. Go back. And they both say, no, we will. We will. But what we're going to see here is the difference between possession and profession. Plenty of people profess. Plenty of people profess that they know God. But only one of them has a true possession of God. She says to them again, turn again, verse 11 to 13, turn again, my daughters. Here now she's speaking forward. She's looking forward. She's not now looking back to what they once were with all their kindness, with all their tenderness, the gentleness, the care that they had for Naomi and the boys all the lovely times that they shared together. She's not looking back now. She's looking forward. There's no one here for you. I, I'm past bearing children. I think the very seeds of her thinking were in redemption. We're going to see that unfold as we go through. I think she knows the very truth of Leviticus 25, and Deuteronomy 25. It's all coming out here. It's starting to come out in, in, in germ form, in seed form. There's no one forward for you. It's going to be difficult. But one says, I will go. The other one says, I will go. I will go with you, says one. I will go back. It's a good thing to make sure of clear professions that demonstrate clear possessions. Here is one who is cleaving to Ruth. The other one was leaving uh, to Naomi. Here is one who is cleaving to Naomi. The other one is leaving, going back, going back to her gods and to her people, to the world. But I just want to now close with this lovely little testimony of Ruth. This is not now the moment that she gets saved, to me at least. This is the moment where she publicly declares what she already has. Seven statements. Just look at them. In verses 16 to 17. Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. It's good to see when there's someone who wants to be with the people of the Lord. I trust that you love the Lord's people. You suffer the Lord's people, but you love the Lord's people. They're the finest people on the face of the earth. I tell my kids that all the time. Christians are truly the finest people on earth. They do anything for you. Pray for you. Care for you. 
don't ask me to go back to them. I'm, I'm coming. She sees a path for her to follow. Where you go, I will go. She sees a place for her fellowship. Where you lodge, I will lodge. She sees a people for her friends. Thy people, my people. Who are your real friends? What friendships are you forming in this world? What friendships are you forming with the people of God? I trust you don't have any unfriends in the house of God. I trust you could shake everybody's hand from the left to the right. I trust that you can all say, you are my friend. Your people, my people. Thy God, my God, a person for her faith. Where you die, I will die. A plot for her funeral. Everything about the people of God, she wanted it for herself. Marks of true salvation. This is a public declaration of where she stood. And that reminds me of baptism, doesn't it? Someone here who is saved, you come under the goodness and the grace of God. By faith, you've been saved. By grace, you've been saved through faith. You are truly saved, but you are disobedient in this regard. You're not baptized. There comes a time where God expects you to make a public declaration. Be baptized. His commandments are not grievous. He wants you to stand and publicly declare who you own and what you are. Death to the world, she is living and moving forward. Then there's a stirring in Bethlehem, and we're going to have to go very, very quickly now. So there's a stirring in the, the people. I'm not going to surmise or conjecture of what they were thinking about this woman coming back and this Moabite. I'm not going to go into any wild imaginations there. But I want you to notice this. She came back to the place where she met. Thirteen famines in the Bible. Thirteen speaks of rebellion, Genesis chapter 12. The very first one was in Abraham's life. There was a famine in the land and he left. But thanks be to God, he came back to Bethel, the very place where he lived. And so did these, and so did Naomi. And that's just ex- where God expects you to come back. They went to Moab, but they came back until they came to Bethlehem. There's no partial return. You can't just come halfway to the house of God. Say, well, you know, I'm, I'm there, I'm not all alone. They came back to the place and they came back properly to the fullness, to the very place that they, they left. At the time of barley harvest, we are really going to have to skip out, but I just want to finish with this. The time of barley harvest. We're going to pick up on this at the end of chapter 2, at the end of the harvest. But let me just say at this point, the, the beginning of barley harvest. Leviticus 23. On the 14th day, there is the Passover. And then on the 15th day commenced the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then on the morrow after the Sabbath, the Sabbath was the Saturday, the first day of the new week was the first fruits. And that's when they came back. God is gracious. Don't ever think for one moment, if you are in a backslidden state, if you have got away from the Lord, that he's not going to give you anything from now and you've ruined it, you've lost it. You're all forgotten about that. It's the beginning of harvest, the barley harvest. The barley speaks of a drooped head. And farmers will tell us that unless that barley has a drooped head, it's not worth harvesting. Here are signs of true repentance, remorse. She recognises, I went out for, hang on, you went out in a famine. Yes, even in famine conditions, I had fullness. And things may not be what you expect in the assembly. You may feel that you're not getting what you ought to get from the assembly. But what are you getting into the assembly? And don't ever forget, where you are in the assembly is not anything to be compared with that. She went out full. And I, t- I want to tell you this, even in famine conditions in this assembly, there is fullness. The Lord brought me back. Salvation is of the Lord. Restoration is of the Lord too, you know. The beginning of our house. And there is the gracious provision of God. And we're going to come to 50 days in the next chapter, to the end of the Bali house, to Pentecost. And we want to see what 
that would speak to us of, in relation to divine things. But may God just help us all. I believe we're in a fact. Don't look at God's chastening upon us with, with disrespect. Ask the Lord, what has that to say to me?